And I have a beautiful and very intelligent guest today. You've seen her here before, hopefully, unless this is your first time seeing me. Her name is Dr. Jen Hawk. She is a psychologist and she has a, a very great, great announcement to make about a, a like it's not a project. It's, it's what she and Dr. Lyle have been doing with their website, esteemdynamics.com. They have this thing called the Wis wisdom, the living wisdom library. I think of the, um, we have this thing here called the living zoo. That's completely different, but this is a living wisdom library. And they have this membership site now that's like $3 a month, less than the price of a Starbucks or $99 forever. And you get an autograph coffee copy of their new book. And she'll talk about that a little bit, but she is here to answer your questions that many of you have emailed in that we didn't get to yesterday with Dr. Lyle. So please welcome back Dr. Jen Hawk. Hello, it's so good to be here. I'm so excited. And I'm yeah, so excited to, to talk about the library too. That's um, it's, it's an awesome new thing that we're doing. Absolutely. That, that's the first thing I would like you to talk about, but I just wanted to show you, I wore this shirt just for you. It says dogs. Oh, yes, you may be. Yes. Because I'll, I always think about you because you've said that like what mask we wear, what shirt we wear, it's sort of a reflection of our personality. Oh my gosh, everything that we do is a reflection of our personality, the kind of ha like how you decorate your house, what kind of car you drive, what kind what you wear, what kind of earrings you have. And certainly you're you're like you're making it easier for the Stone Age village to infer your character and your personality by emblazoning it with actual words. So you're you're providing a cognitive shortcut for people who might be confused about your priorities. But dogs are definitely my priority. Yeah, so, that's funny because yeah. I always have a shirt that almost always that says vegan or dogs or so. Thank mm -hmm. you for clearing that up. So please talk yeah. about this new, it's not really a new venture, but it's an improved venture that you and Dr. Lyle have been doing. And I'll post yeah. the links. Yeah, I mean, it's new in the sense that we've sort of, co we've consolidated everything that he and I are doing together. So for people who are not familiar um, with either of us, we're, we're both working in um, uh, the sort of psychological space that's adjacent to the plant-based movement. So we talk to a lot of people who are, a lot of people in your audience, AJ, who are trying to improve their diet and their lifestyle and give them um, give them advice that is sourced in sort of a different kind of paradigm than they may be getting from typical therapists. A lot of therapists, you go in and they're, they're telling you that your issues around food and um, lifestyle are very much rooted in childhood damage or, um, or that you're trying to, you're trying to fill a, a hole in your soul of some kind. And as a former, as a person in recovery, I, I've, I've heard this for many, many years. And we, we come at this from um, a very different perspective, which is known as evolutionary psychology, which a lot of your viewers are very familiar with Dr. Lyle, and so I don't need to go through the whole thing. But the, the nutshell version is that evolutionary psychology begins with the premise that humans are animals, just like any other animal, and that we, we, can, we can make inferences about what is difficult for us to do and to accomplish and why we can't meet our goals and why we struggle with motivation in certain areas, including in, in health and lifestyle, um, because of our, our nature as humans. So we're always, we're always pulling back to the Stone Age. How would we have solved this problem in the Stone Age? And how is there a mismatch with how we adapted in our evolutionary history to solve the problem and the modern environment? And there's almost always a big mismatch. And so that's where we kind of began our investiga investigation is what, what went wrong in the modern environment? And that's where the whole idea of the pleasure trap comes from. The pleasure trap is just the fact that we live in an environment that we never adapted to live in. We've got all this abundant, super rich food, and we are a species that adapted to cope with scarcity um, and starvation and to be really efficient around that. So, so that's basically what Dr. Lyle and I do. We, we help people who are dealing with all kinds of issues, not just health and diet, but relationship issues, career issues, um, friendship, anything that people would go to a normal psychologist, a normal psychologist for, um, we we bring. Hey, wait a their, second, isn't that an oxymoron? A yeah. normal psychologist. Yeah, there's there's definitely a little um, you know memes in the psychologist world that the you know the psychologists go into that business because they have the biggest issues, and there's there's perhaps some truth to that. Um, and I just to be really clear, I'm actually not a clinical psychologist. Now that I've sort of besmirched the profession, um, my PhD is in the social sciences, but I've I've taken on um, evolutionary psychology as a real first just a major intellectual interest, and then uh, developed my own clinical practice in collaboration with with uh, Doug. So we work very closely. To together. We're co-authoring a new book, which will be out next year. I know sometimes people are signing up for the lifetime membership on the site thinking we're immediately going to send them the book. It's not ready yet. We, we still need to, we need to finish up some edits and get it into production and do everything that needs to happen. But that's, um, we're looking at probably 2021. We're not exactly sure. We don't have a release date yet. So, but we, if you've signed up for a lifetime membership, you were on our list and we will, we will come to you right before it's ready to send to make sure we have your address correct. So um, we're, we're writing a book that is essentially the, 
the statement. It's like, I think of it as half textbook and half self-help book on how to use these principles in evolutionary psychology to, to optimize your life on all of these dimensions. Um, and we also do a lot of other things. We, we talk to you, we, talk, we do other podcasts. He and I have a podcast every week um, and we, we just produce a lot of content. So the new website is a, it's a compendium of everything that he and I are both doing in one place. And there's a lot of stuff that people have never seen before. So it's not been publicly available before. We sat down and we recorded nearly four hours of introductory lectures um, uh, on human nature, we call it the human nature series, really explaining in great detail, um, you know, sort of where conventional psychology gets it wrong, what human, what really motivates humans and what directs their relationships. Um, he talks about sort of fundamental psychological analysis. I talk a lot about personality in the big five. And then we talk a great deal about esteem and esteem processes, both self-esteem and esteem between yourself and other people, which is the main thing that we're interested in. So that is members only content, four hours of, of us just mansplaining the heck out of evolutionary psychology. Um, and then a lot of other things, special um, subscriber only uh, Q and A's. We did one last week. I'm doing another one later this afternoon. That's just me this week. Um, so if people want to join that live, they can head over to the, it's called the Living Wisdom Library. Um, and, and you can join for $3 a month. That is the, that's sort of our, our base rate. But you can also join for a year for 29 or for a lifetime for 99. And you can pay that in three installments if 99 is too much. We really, really, we're not trying to be slick and salesy about this at all. We really, we literally wanted to be as cheap as we could be to make it available to as many people as possible so they can benefit because it's really, this is revolutionary insight into human nature and how to solve esteem problems and health problems and anything, anything else. So we're not trying to, it's not a get rich quick scheme for us. We just wanted to provide the content essentially at cost to people um, so it can be available to, to anybody who wants to join and share at, at that $3 a month. Well, and also, yeah, you can never be accused of that because just the rates to see or, see or have a consult with you or Dr. Lyle, it's like mm -hmm. $75. I mean, you can't go anywhere and have a consult. <laughs> Yeah. for that with, su yeah. with such an amazing uh, person and doctor. And Jesse says, can you ask Dr. Hawk her opinion on the major difference between a counseling session with her versus a normal psychologist? If that um, is well, the major difference is that I'm trying to get you to fire me. <laughs> and I think Doug would, would agree with this. We're there, we're there trying to solve the, the origin of your problem. I think a lot of, I went through a lot of conventional therapy myself um, and it's all the sort of conventional modalities are like, well, we did some really good work this week, but we're gonna have to have you come back next week so we can dig a little deeper into your childhood and figure out where your intimacy issues really came from. When that day that your your father ignored you when you were watching the movie and, and you tried to get his attention and he didn't pay enough attention, that, that set in motion this whole lifelong baggage that you have. That is all, as Doug would say, bullshit. That is not how this whole thing works. And so we are, we are in the business of sort of really getting to the roots of what is going on in your life right now. What is what are the dynamics of the relationship that you're struggling with, whether it's a romantic relationship or a friendship or at work? Um, what's going haywire in that set of circumstances and particularly the esteem signals that are being sent back and forth that we can try to intervene with and fix with some insight into human nature, how people um, get their status threatened, how people uh, are, are looking for signals that they they belong and that they're valued and if they're not getting that they're likely to lash out so we're very we, we're more like engineers or we're like mechanics trying to really figure out what's going what why is your engine making that knocking noise we're not just trying to get the knocking noise to go away we're trying to figure out like why is it happening what is the root of the problem and is it possible for us to fix that and if it's not possible to fix it and sometimes it's not um, then how can we come to some sort of new relationship through this understanding that it's it's not it's not a personal thing it's a it's a reflection of what humans are and, and how we work in the world thank you that's a very good explanation of what you do. I'm curious how you guys hooked up because a lot of times when people are similar, there'll be competition, but you guys are so collaborative. Oh, I think we complement each other really well. So we're, we are, you know, we overlap <laughs> almost entirely with our view of the world. And, and the thing about evolutionary psychology is it's grounded in what's called consilience. So consilience is this notion in, in, um, in science that if something is true, it's going to be true no matter what lens you put on it. So, so if, you, if you're an anthropologist, 
if you're a chemist, if you're a biologist, if you're an archaeologist, if something is truly capital T true, you should be coming to more or less the same conclusion, no matter what your disciplinary bias is. Um, and the paradigmatic case of that is the, the theory of evolution. So no matter what your training is, if you're looking at, if you're an archaeologist or a chemist or a biologist or a political scientist or an economist, you're, you're coming to the same kinds of conclusions about how evolution behaves and how it how it shapes behavior over time and and how you can make inferences about things like relationship and self-esteem as a result so the we we are so grounded in this consilient view of the world that if you follow consilience and the logic of evolution you almost always come to the same kind of conclusion so he and i don't disagree on virtually anything because we're we're using the same guiding principle to get us to the conclusion we just take slightly varying routes to get there so we have very different styles and approaches because we have very different personalities um, and I actually talk about that on the website in the personality module so um, and lots of other things that I've done on this so um, we we're we, we interpret reality a little bit differently but it gets us the, the many paths up the, the same mountain to the same the same peak so and I think we we complement each other well in that yin yang kind of way I'm a lot nicer than he is <laughs> and prettier too <laughs> oh, well he might disagree with that <laughs> yeah. well the only thing he's really wrong about I think is astrology otherwise you guys are <laughs> spot on you know yeah, people, um, people who follow me know that I, I have a long and storied history in the New Age movement. I worked as an astrologer for many years. I, um, I, I, can, I feel like I, I sort of have a, a little bit more of a position of authority to talk about evolution now and evolutionary psychology because I really did my time in the woo-woo world um, and uh, spent a lot of time immersed in, in those thoughts and that whole paradigm and loved it and still find it very entertaining and am very classically a Leo and Doug is very classically a Virgo for what it's worth. So oh my God, tell me, tell me yeah. about it. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I have so many questions live. I don't know what to do because so many were sent in and this is like, I feel like, you know, I'm going to um, end up offending somebody, but well, um, I'll try to, I'll try to be quick. We'll, okay. we'll get through as much as we can. I don't, Perfect. I don't take 45 minutes per question like my... Uh, like okay. My, and, like and some my... of them are long, so I'll try to read them fast. No uh, this is from Jan. Dear Dr. Hawk, I know you said you'd have some experience with alcoholism, alcoholism, and I'm wondering what you think of 12-step programs in general mm -hmm. and the ones for food addiction in particular. Are they helpful or hurtful? I've gone to a few different meetings and they don't really resonate with me because they insist we say things like, I am powerless over food, which I don't believe I am, although I certainly have trouble with certain foods. And they either don't recommend a sound vegan food plant, or if they do, it's always based on weighing and measuring, which I learned from Dr. Lau yesterday is not a good idea. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So kind of a multi-part question. I'll, uh, the first part is whether I think 12-step programs for food addiction are helpful. I do not. So I think 12-step programs for alcoholism can be helpful um, to some degree for food because the information is so bad, um, as you're pointing out with the weighing and measuring and the sort of focus on calorie counting and it's, um, you know, there are really no go foods and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's a, I find that the advice actually undermines any benefit that you would get from the rest of the 12 step experience. Whereas with the, with AA um, or Narcotics Anonymous or, you know, some of the others, it's the, um, the advice of abstinence is, is solid and you're getting a few other benefits from the 12-step process. There is no special magic sauce to 12-step. You don't, you don't need 12-step to get sober. What's happening with people who, who achieve sobriety by participating in 12-step is that the, they, they happen to be the people who were likely going to get sober anyway because of certain personality features. So a high level of conscientiousness and a high level of motivation, the same qualities that you need to um, to stick to this diet, to, to achieve a lot of goals in life that are working against your instincts. So alcoholism is working against your instincts in exactly the same way that super normal food is. It is the pleasure trap. It's a much more tenacious version of the pleasure trap because it's hijacking your pleasure signaling so much more strongly than the food is. Um, but if you can extract yourself from that, it means you have a lot of grit, you have a lot of conscientiousness, and you probably also have a lot of motivation. That is all independent of whether you're participating in 12-step or not. 12-step itself, can be can be a nice environment to um, achieve a little bit of 
of community esteem when you're probably pretty esteem deficient. So if you've had a problem with alcohol or other drug abuse for any amount of time, your social life is probably in great disarray. You probably have really messed up relationships that are based on using. Um, I know mine, mine all were at that time. So that community that comes with 12 step of, of people who are on the same journey that you are, who are able to give you the, um, the, the appropriate esteem for going through this process that they have also been going through, that is very valuable and you might not be able to get that otherwise. I'm getting, we have a helicopter going overhead. Uh, this is the, the joys of sitting outside. Um, so the, the esteem signaling can be really, really powerful for getting you through that initial withdrawal period, which is an incredibly difficult thing to, to try to put yourself through, um, particularly when it's something with it, that's it's so addictive as alcohol. So I still will go to meetings periodically if I'm in a new place. I kind of like to get the annual coin. It's like, a, you know, it's like a little bling. Um, but I, I don't credit 12 step per se with getting sober. Um, it was a nice place to go and distract myself and find a little community when I was otherwise really deficient in those things. That's great. Thank you. I really appreciate that answer. Judy says, Dear Dr. Hawk, can you help me with some cognitive dissonance I experience? I've been an ethical vegan for over 30 years. And as, and as such, all my pets are rescues from the shelter. And I get them when they are much older. Therefore, I have a very difficult time transitioning them to a vegan diet. When I force them to be vegan, then on walks, they'll try to eat dead squirrels or even kill bunnies. This is such a daily source of stress for me that I feed them animals. And I'm constantly being criticized by my fellow vegans. Do you have any advice for me other than just not having pets anymore? Oh, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, the chasing the bunnies and the squirrels is not something that you, you really can do anything about. I mean, these are these are predators and they're gonna, you know, some, some dogs in particular are very motivated to seek out prey animals. Um, and so I would, you know, sort of curtail that behavior as best as possible, but not at the not to the the point of um, really constraining the, the dog's existence in the world. But I think con transitioning them to the vegan kibble is is less of an issue. And most dogs, much like much like humans, just need a little bit of a transition period. I think that is worth doing for your own ethical commitments because non-vegan dog food is um, really uh, really bad stuff. It's really it's really bad stuff for a lot of reasons on many many dimensions that we don't need to get into, but um, you can very rapidly disgust and appall yourself if you do a little bit of research as to what some of those ingredients actually mean. Some of those nice, like nice benign sounding ingredients like animal fat. Um, if you look into what that actually is, it's pretty horrific. Um, and so I, I think the, the vegan kibble is pretty tasty and you can, you can make it more tasty by adding some things that doggies like, like sweet potato, I put nutritional yeast on there sometimes, blueberries, uh, my dogs love kale. Uh, so, you know, you can put a little water that most of the flavor of the kibble is on the coating of the outside of the kibble. It's not on the inside. So if you activate that with a little hot water and you add some other nom noms on there, other little vegan treats, the little, um, my dogs love the peanut butter wiggle biscuits from V dog. Um, um, those are those are all ways that the dog, if it's hungry, it's going to eat and it will get used to the new diet and it's going to have way better digestion. And I mean, dogs are omnivorous, but they do just fine on on a vegan diet. Um, and the longest lived dogs in the world are on vegan diets. Um, and so I would I would highly recommend transitioning them if you if you possibly can. So my dogs are very happy on their vegan kibble have, no, you know, far fewer, they were both rescues as well, um, and had some digestive issues early on that have totally gone away, and they, they're very happy with their food. Um, it's worth reminding people if they haven't heard the story, there's, um, Dr. Lyle tells this anecdote all the time of a, it's in the, it's, uh, tells the story in the pleasure trap of um, a bunch of, a bunch of lab rats that were fed sort of typical rat chow for some amount of time, and were very happy on their rat chow, and then the researchers put them on effectively a super normal diet, sort of the equivalent of humans eating a standard American diet and the rats loved it and they gained about you know between 20 and 50 percent of their body weight very quickly just like humans would just on the same kind of bell curve that humans would and the rats were like this is living this is great then the researchers took the super normal food away and reintroduced the rat chow and the average rat rather than eating the rat chow went on strike fasted for two weeks because it was like um no i'm not gonna waste precious chewing and tummy energy on this crap when the bread and chocolate is coming back so i'm gonna hold out and they basically waited until they were sufficiently hungry and had lost enough of that weight gain that the cost benefit analysis changed and they finally resigned themselves to the rat chow so humans humans are just like this and so is your so are your rescue dogs Thank you. I, I like that idea of num nums. I do that with my husband's yeah. food to get him to eat it. I add num nums. You know? <laughs> totally. <laughs> 
maybe that rat right. trick some of the parents whose kids just won't eat healthy food. Maybe they should try that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> works works for all species. <laughs> That's funny. This is this is a fun question. It reminds me of this restaurant they had in LA, a Moroccan restaurant where people actually ate with their hands. Claire mm-hmm. says, I love to eat with my hands, obviously not soup, but almost anything else. My husband thinks it's disgusting. I really enjoy my food more this way. Is this wrong? Isn't this how they ate in the Stone Age? I have, hold on a second. Somebody's saying something about nom noms. Oh, look at this. <laughs> I have cherries. Oh, hi, hi. You guys might know. This is my, this yeah. is my partner, Michael Greger. Oh, <laughs> I wonder how these two got together. Hmm. I wonder. Oh. It's very mysterious. And he brought me, he brought me cherries, seasonally appropriate treats. So That's all right. M G. <laughs> Where's my check? Where's my check? This it's is amazing. It's oh my gosh. You guys have questions. Do you have a quick well, question? Well, can, can Dr. Greger answer the one? Is it okay to eat with our hands? Oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead and answer that one. He's actually eating with his hands right now. <laughs> he can't hear the question. Oh, oh, is it okay to eat with our hands? Is there any problem with eating? With, I mean, I would think there, that's oh, the... Let's see. <laughs> yeah, it's totally fine. Mwah. Thank you, baby. I love you. <laughs> I love you. OMG, I'm dying here. Thank you. That was a really, that was a surprise. What a wonderful surprise. He's a, he's a wonderful, if people are not familiar with Dr. Michael Greger and nutritionfacts.org, I will go ahead and, um, and recommend that extremely highly. It's a talk about a compendium of resources. I mean, we have a lot on the Living Wisdom Library, but Nutrition Facts, which has been, you know, a decade of research and, and uh, wonderful material on everything that people could possibly have any curiosity about, about evidence-based results and evidence-based findings for optimizing a plant-based diet. That is the the place to go. Um, And he also just released a book called How to Survive a Pandemic, which um, if people don't know, that was originally, he, he, that's, that's sort of his original passion and training was in infectious disease. Um, and uh, had had basically done all of this incredible research uh, on pandemics and tried to communicate it to the masses and nobody wanted to hear it. And lo and behold, now it's uh, finding a little bit more of a receptive audience. So if you're curious about where pandemics come from, spoiler alert, it's from our relationship with animals and particularly factory farms and um, the sort of domesticated animals that we eat for food and that we use for, for things like dog food. Um, that is what creates these, these super viruses, these, mass, these incredible mutations that are able to take out huge percentages of our population. So um, recommend his book as well. But Absolutely. I mean, how, can, yeah. how can you not love a guy who brings you cherries? I mean, come on. <laughs> So I guess Claire's question was, is that not, is it okay? Like maybe physiologically, but, but her husband doesn't like it, but she seems to enjoy the food more hand to mouth. Um, I think that's absolutely, I mean, this is a personality quirk. So uh, Dr. Lyle and I will talk all the time about sort of how you have specific circuits for things. Um, and if you enjoy that, that is just, you, you had more ancestors that were more successful eating food with their hands. I mean, that's how we, we didn't have silverware until quite recently in our evolutionary history. So this is a, a very ancestrally aligned way of eating. And if it, if it, gives, it gives you pleasure and you enjoy it, then um, I, I would say if it's causing your husband great distress, Stress, maybe it's worth thinking about compromising on. Um, but there's, I, I know plenty of people who predominantly eat with their hands and there's no issue. So. Okay. Thank yeah. you. This is a little long, but it, uh, um, we don't get as many men writing in, but I think it's a good question because it sure. sort of reminds me of a situation I hear from people that are uh, on, on weight loss programs. Mm-hmm. Hi, Dr. Hawk, and thank you for answering my question. My name is Randy. I'm a 42 year old male, six foot one inches tall and 150 pounds. I've never had any health or weight problems until now when I recently lost 30 pounds. I contracted a severe case of food poisoning on a cruise and ended up with fo- post infectious inflammatory bowel disease, causing me to lo- lose 30 pounds. And now I look quite thin. I'm working with one of the top place top plant-based doctors now to restore my health and restore my gut, but he said it could take at least six months. I have to be on a very strict diet, which is not a problem for me because my wife is an excellent cook and it makes my somewhat limited options very delicious. I'm very motivated not to step out of line because even one bite of off-plan food can cause a flare and I'll suffer for three days with pain and bloody diarrhea. The -hmm. problem I am having from the illness is psychosocial and I don't know how to deal with it. The doctor said that I must give up alcohol and coffee, and it's not been a problem because my wife has been kind enough to give these up as well in solidarity, so they're no longer in the house and there's no temptation. My friends are a different story. Now that we no longer drink alcohol, the social invitations are becoming fewer and fewer because they say we're 
not fun anymore. I've, I've explained to them that I can't eat at restaurants for the time being because of the seriousness of my condition. And if they invite me over, I'll either have to eat in advance or bring my own food to which they say either, well, don't come, or if they do come, they mock me. I've never experienced this kind of treatment from anyone in my entire life. So I'm interested in knowing what really is going on. The fact that these people are so unsupportive has me wondering if they ever were my friends in the first place. My wife said she's heard of this happening to some of her girlfriends that were dieting, but I cannot understand why someone would treat someone with a serious disease like this. Any enlightenment you can give me on the subject would be appreciated. That's yeah. horrible. Yeah, well, it's horrible. It's very common. And I think a lot of women are very familiar with this dynamic where if you start seeing a little bit of success with some major dietary change, suddenly it's those those friends who were super, super happy to be in miserable solidarity with you or are suddenly very threatened by your success, whether you're having success on a diet or success in a relationship. And this is rooted in major evolutionary paradigms and, and dynamics that we talk a lot about. So the, the longer, more extended answer to this, is if people are really interested is um, Dr. Lyle has a video on our website called getting along without going along um, and has, you know, really gets into the nitty gritty of where this comes from and some real good strategies for phrases that you can use and, and how to help mitigate what's going on. But fundamentally what's going on is you've become a threat to their status. So when we talk about esteem, and esteem dynamics, we're talking about status fundamentally. It's sort of a less friendly word, but that's what it is. So, so we are Stone Age creatures. We are, we are really quite unchanged from the end of the Stone Age in terms of our actual physiology. And also our, our brains are really unchanged. We are the same, we're the same species. If anybody out there has seen the fine piece of American cinema, cinema called Encino Man, this was a great movie, um, came out in the 90s. I say great in, in big quotes, but a very entertaining movie in the 90s about um, an unfrozen and cave person in California who seamlessly merges into modern Los Angeles life um, or Encino life, I guess, specifically. So the idea being that if you took any one of us and put us back in the Stone Age or vice versa, we would, we would be unrecognizable. We, we would fit right in. It would be a seamless transition as long as we were sort of used to the procedures. So, so we are Stone Age creatures, which means that we are adapted. Everything that we adapted to thrive in was a Stone Age environment. So the kind of food that was available, the kind of um, mortality threats that were most breathing down our neck, and the kind of social problems that were most relevant. So the social problem that's most relevant in the Stone Age village, when you're living in a community with like one or 200 people who are all up in your Kool-Aid all the time and are hyper aware of who you are and who you're sleeping with and what's going on. And it's like, everything is very, you have no secrets in the Stone Age. So that's one of the most important things that governs Stone Age life is relative status. So there's a hierarchy. There's sort of like, who's at the top? Who's at the bottom? Where are you in the middle? So all the action really kind of happens in the middle. And if you've been going through through life with your with your friends and they're sort of like thinking that they have a little bit of an edge on you in some kind of way and this doesn't have to be shitty you know people are not people are not really explicitly conscious about this but you have if you're really honest with yourself you will you'll find that you kind of have this awareness of your your social standing relative to other people that you're close to in terms of you know who's who's got the nicest house who's got the better job who's got the better spouse it's all like all this this is why we have so much gossip in modern life it's where it all comes from is these stone age dynamics so what happens when you start changing your diet or you start finding some success you get a promotion you find a relationship you lose some weight you have threatened the status quo. You have gone from like number seven in the village to number six, which means because it's all zero sum that your buddy is now bumped down a notch. And that can be very, very, very threatening to people. Um, and it's particularly threatening among women, as women are very familiar with, if they are the person at work who, you know, it's one thing to all commiserate about how everyone's struggling with the same dietary problems and everybody wants to lose weight, but you start having success and those women start being real catty and stabbing you in the back. And it, it gets really, really nasty in a hurry. And so this this questioner is seeing a version of that where his his success and and um even without success just kind of changing what you're doing in a direction that is maybe not entirely understandable to the people that you're you're with because they're sort of frightened and confused by it and they don't know why you're they, they can't make sense of it and they they infer that it would not work for them or they think that it's a bad idea all of that is just inherently very threatening to all of those very fragile interpersonal dynamics so i went through a version of this when i got sober from alcohol as well to, to a lesser degree with the food because i was embedded in some um a more of a plan 
plant-based world at that point. But when I got sober from alcohol, I had to give up my, my partner at the time, all virtually all of my friends, my job, because it was putting me in proximity to alcohol. Like these were trade-offs that I had to make to preserve the, the new cost benefit analysis I had, which was that I like alcohol was going to kill me and I have to stay sober at any cost. And you're having a version of this with, you know, getting out of line has major health consequences for you. So it may be the case that these are friendships that really there wasn't that much substance there to begin with. They were, they were built on this really fragile social contract that you had with these people where that depended on you being sort of a notch below them, or at least not, not rocking the boat in any kind of way. And you've rocked the boat and it has disturbed them. And so maybe they will come around and get used to it. You're not in the business of trying to convince them of anything. You definitely don't want to start telling them what a great diet it is and how they should do it because that becomes even more threatening. So the best thing to do is just to, keep doing what you're doing quietly, try to, you know, make it as, as um, the least intrusive process for them as possible. And if they come around, they come around. And if they don't, they were, they were never really your friends to begin with. And that's fine. That just creates, it creates space for new people in your coalition who belong there. But it doesn't sound like he was trying to gain status by doing this. He was sick. It wasn't like he was trying to lose weight or quit drinking because he thought it was a, like a, sure. Yeah, but it's this... but it's a healthier diet. It's a healthy and, and people have that perception that you're a little more virtuous than they are, that you're doing you're doing a better job with something that they themselves struggle with. And so they too are aware that they would be better off if they ate a healthier diet, maybe even a plant-based, whole food plant-based diet. But they, for whatever reason, don't believe that they can or that they don't believe that they can at the level that he's doing it. And so it just is intrinsically threatening to them. Um, and this is this is human nature. We are we are souped up chimps and we get we get all sort of angsty and, and, and threatened uh, very easily by these kinds of things. I mean, I, I just can't imagine somebody, your friend doing that. I think about Jerry Seinfeld's quote, people, huh, they're the worst. They're the so, worst. That's why, you, let's go back to your shirt, dogs, dogs, yes, people, maybe. Yeah. Well, I love all the sayings. That I'm, I mean, you should write a book because you said up in your Kool-Aid. I've never heard that before. That is a great one. And once you said magical unicorns flying out your butt, you have some great genisms yes. that, that I think we need to write down. I'm going to skip to a live question before okay. it disappears on the screen totally. from Lou. He's uh, again, I can't see your picture, Lou. So Lou could be a girl or a boy. So I apologize. But it says, is CBT a scam? It seeks to change our feelings by changing our thoughts. But if these are just expressions of personality, what hope can there be for changes at either a cognitive or co cognitive level? Oh, interesting question. So, so Lou is asking about cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. It's not a scam, um, but what CBT is doing is going back to my example of uh, fixing the knocking engine, in, knocking noise in your engine in your car. If you take your car into a mechanic and you say, my engine's making a disturbing knocking noise, what CBT is going to do is it's going to figure out a way to make the knocking noise stop or be quieter. It's going to, it's going to do whatever it can. It's going to like, you know, wrap a sound absorber around it. It's going to put headphones in your ears so you don't hear it anymore. It's going to, it's going to take the noise away, but it's not grounded in any real theory of, or any accurate theory of why the engine is making that noise to begin with. And so it's like, we're, it's working more at the symptomatic level than the root cause level. Um, so they're not, it's still much more useful than going to some psychodynamic Freudian therapist who's going to try to unwind your childhood damage. Those people are a scam. Those people are operating on in like career incentives to keep you a client forever. They, they are um, essentially trying to get you to generate pain um, to generate more paychecks for them. So the, you know, evolutionary psychology is the, the sort of the, the best strategy that you're going to get clinically. There are not that many of us out in the world because this is a fairly new way of looking at psychology. Um, evolutionary biology has been around for quite some time, but to being applied to sort of problems of human behavior and relationships, that's something that Dr. Lyle really uh, pioneered. I mean, this didn't exist in a clinical sense until Dr. Lyle started developing these concepts um, a couple of decades ago and has, has built them up into you know, pretty much virtually the only real clinical clinical psychologist who's working exclusively in that paradigm. So CBT is great if you find a good CBT um, practitioner, they can really help quiet it down. They can help you work with what's coming up um, and, and help you, you know, question the irrational thought. That's sort of the, the CBT mantra. We are doing the same thing. We want you to question that irrational thought 
but it's so much richer if you can understand what is generating the irrational thought. The irrational thought is being generated by systems that you have adapted to that are trying to protect you, that are trying to encourage you to survive and reproduce to get your genes into the next generation. And sometimes it goes haywire, either because it's a mismatch with the modern environment or because you have uh, what, the, what Lou is suggesting, um, you have a major personality distor distortion. So people have personality distortions. People are all over the map with their personalities and you cannot change your personality. That is, that is genetically set. Your DNA is really, it, it's, it's inscribing your core personality characteristics. So if you were an extremely conscientious human, you're gonna have a lot of irrational thoughts. You're gonna have, your brain is gonna be telling you um, to run a much, much costlier, worst case scenario um, evaluation on any particular problem than is actually appropriate for the problem. So if you can recognize that you're a hyper conscientious nutcase, as Doug, Doug calls um, with great love, people like this HCNCs, and that your brain is generating a lot of noise that's running this sort of exaggerated worst case scenario all the time. If you can step back from that and recognize that's a lot of noise. I don't necessarily need to act on every thought that my brain spits out because I recognize that I have a distorted brain that is a little loud relative to the actual degree of the problem. That can be a very empowering thing for people. But we're, and CBT is also trying to get you there. It's just not rooting it in um, evolutionary fundamentals like we are. Okay. Noma thought that Lou asked about CBD, not CBT. So I'll try to articulate a little bit better. Oh God, what was about CBD? Oh, right. No, no, yeah. no, no, it, it is about CBT. I, that's oh, what was the question. Oh, yeah. No, okay. I, I'm that's just a, saying, I, I need to- That's a whole other question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I need to articulate better. So okay. there was a question live from Aubrey, but people have to understand there's a lot of people watching so that your question disappears quickly. But I do remember that it was about, what do you think about affirmations? Oh, affirmations. So yeah, I always think of Stuart Smalley when I think of affirmations. So from the old Saturday Night Live in the 90s, there was the Al Franken Stuart Smalley character who'd sit in front of a mirror and he'd say, you know, he'd pump himself up. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone dog it, people, gone like, people it. like me. Like me. Um, I think affirmations are fine. I don't think they're damaging. Um, and I I think they can be, it's, it's sort of almost a um, a psychosom psychosomatic thing. If you really, if you believe that the affirmations are helping you and they're, they're building you up and they're affecting some kind of state change for you, I don't want to take those affirmations away from you. I have used affirmations a lot. There's a big part of my sort of new age world. I will still occasionally, if I'm about to deal with something super stressful um, or something, something that I'm afraid of, I've talked before on your show, AJ, about how I have irrational fear of flying. I will do some affirmations. You know, I definitely will engage in that kind of thing because it can be helpful for redirecting your thought process. Again, your thoughts are not random. They're not irrational. They're coming from these survival and reproduction algorithms, but that doesn't mean they're helpful. Doesn't mean that you need to attach to every thought that's being churned out of your brain. So if you can distract yourself with an affirmation, more power to you. I think they can be beautiful and, and lovely. They're not going to fundamentally change your life. They're not going to affect real, real changes in the kinds of thoughts that are being generated and causing you the suffering that you're, you're trying to resolve with those affirmations. But I don't, I'm not, I, I, I don't want to be dismissive of them. And I don't, I don't, I'm not in the business of trying to take them away. Well, they can't, they can't hurt. That's the thing. So that can't hurt. I, I think of that movie, The Help. You is good. You is kind. You is important. There, there you go. Very similar, very, yep. very similar notion. But yeah, the, it can be damaging if you are leaning into affirmations without confronting the survival and reproduction algorithms that are generating the, the suffering in the esteem dynamics or the interpretations of reality that are actually causing you the suffering. So if you're avoiding doing that work because you're sort of like, you know, pollyanna in your way through life with the affirmations, then you're being avoidant and you're, you're missing an opportunity to, to really kind of improve your situation in life. But, um, you know, as a sort of addition to your toolkit, they're fine. Right, but not by themselves. Cause like I use them, like one of the affirmations when I was still heavy was something like I eat healthy and nutritious foods in the right amount. And I easily maintain my trim ideal weight. Sure. And I use that, but I also did it. Like I didn't just yes. look in the mirror and say it. I actually yeah. did what the affirmation was saying. So totally. So Totally. Yeah. The affirmation itself. I mean, there's so much kind of bad science out there about what um, a lot of people will call blobology, the sort of idea that, oh, it lights up a new part of your brain when you do these kinds of things. And the, the visualization is effectively the same thing as doing the thing. And um, the, the, this is just not, not how it works. The evidence is not there for that. So um, it it's, it's, can be very helpful as a distraction and you know, a way to build some habits and some ritual in your life that, that essentially provides a shortcut for doing the right thing. The more 
you can make doing the right thing easier for yourself. If affirmations are part of that, then all that matters is that you're doing the right thing and you're staying on track and you're making these fundamental changes toward improving your life. So whatever gets you there. Great. Uh, this question from Sherry, I think a lot of people will be able to re relate to. Why can't I throw anything away? It's not a financial thing with me. And I'm not to the point where I would have to be on the TV show Hoarders, but I find it hard to part for things with things like greeting cards that people gave me a long time ago, wrapping paper and bows that are pretty and can be reused and the like. I really want to simplify my life and move and downsize. I feel this clutter is taking control of my life. Are there any therapies or strategies you recommend? Yeah, this is it's pretty common as well. So there are a couple of different things going on here. So when we're talking about personality um, and personality characteristics, if you can think of like, if you've got a little circuit in your brain for how much of a hoarder you are, that is on a continuum, just like everything else is. So, you know, you're the, the, the thickness of your fingernails. If we were to take everybody in California and plot them on a graph and, and measure with great detail, the thickness of their fingernails, that would fall on what we call a bell curve. So it's a bell shaped curve and most people are right in the average of that bell shaped curve they have average thickness of their fingernails you have some people at the end not many who have very thin fingernails and some people who have very thick fingernails so this is also how personality works so conscientiousness is going to fall on a bell curve of most people are in the middle their average conscientiousness relative to a, an appropriate level of conscientiousness for any problem that life throws at them some people not many are hyper conscientious nutcases who are way too conscientious about things that they shouldn't be conscientious about and some people not too many are total flakes who can't pay their bills who don't you know find themselves getting kicked out of apartments who don't pay insurance like all of this kind of stuff so this is the continuum of behavior and it applies to everything so something like a hoarding instinct is also going to fall on a bell curve so it sounds like she's just a little she's not on hoarders but she's a little clingy about stuff and a lot of people are so there's no no issue here this is just kind of how you're wired the other thing that is informing that is that we didn't have stuff in the stone age if we had stuff in the stone age it was immensely precious it was some sort of heirloom that had you know that we had to hold on to that had enormous value just because the the, the cost benefit analysis on holding on to anything and transporting it as you move to new locations and through wars and famine and everything else what would have had to be a very precious thing to to run a cost benefit analysis on to, on to keeping it um, and we didn't have money we didn't we didn't accumulate we didn't accumulate wealth we didn't accumulate riches we didn't accumulate property. Um, and so the fact that we it's so easy for us to accumulate things is hijacking that part of our brain that says if we have a thing, it must be very precious, my precious, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's getting, it's getting completely redirected. And because you have a slightly more clingy, hoardy personality, than maybe the, the baseline of the species, you're more likely to hold on to it than other people are. So there's no, again, there's no magic sauce in resolving this. You can't, you can't change your personality, you can't change your orientation toward this problem. Um, if people are really in trouble, sometimes the best thing to do is to outsource the problem to somebody who's going to come in and clean it all up for you without your active participation. It has a lot to do with you looking at the item and holding it in your hand and then not being able to part with it. Where if you just give somebody permission and you say, hey, look, out of sight, out of mind, um, please take care of this for me. Don't even tell me what you're throwing away unless you really have big questions about it. That can really help help people deal with um, major amounts of clutter. The other extreme, if it's really affecting your life and it is, it's really like you, you can't live with the clutter and it's um, causing you a lot of emotional angst, uh, I will recommend that people get a storage unit for some amount of time and go through the process of just boxing it up putting it in the storage unit and making a deal with yourself that if you don't think about it for six months while it's in the storage unit, then whatever's in that box just needs to go. Just like tape it up. Don't, don't make a list of what's in there and, you know, prepay six months on the storage unit and at six months say, okay, have I thought about those things? Have I missed them? Have I wanted to get them out of there? If not, then just let them go. That means it's not, not that important in your conscious, in your consciousness. Right. You know, th things like I live in the desert, but I still have an umbrella because I don't want to buy it every time the three yeah. days it rains, you know? Yeah. There's, um, there's a great documentary called The Minimalists, and they have a rule that I have followed with my decluttering efforts, which is the 2020 rule. So if it can be replaced for less than $20 within 20 miles of your home, those just in case things, you can really let them go, especially with Amazon Prime and the, the, the immediacy with which we can get those just in case things. If you're holding on to something like an umbrella, just 
just in case it rains, um, you you could get yourself an umbrella for less than twenty dollars within twenty miles, no problem. And it's taking up space in your psychic right. awareness. That, that is great. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Yeah, yeah, it's mm-hmm. been really helpful for me to do a twenty twenty rule. I love it. Thank you. Yep. I just yep. want to read some nice comments. Denise says, "Well, Jen, you seem like a great match for the doc. I've never listened to you before, but I can see you are very wise, smart, and caring. Not to mention adorable. Best of oh, happiness to you both." And uh, let's see, I wrote this, I, I, the speed is going fast. I took a picture and that says, Chef AJ, I would love it if you would do an interview with both Dr. Hawk and Dr. Greger. Well, I would love that too. Cause I just realized if you guys had a baby, your website would be esteemfacts.org. <laughs> That's, I, I suppose it would be. There are probably other nutritional esteem. I mean, we, could, we could think about how that would work, but um, yes, we will we'll have to ask the good doctor about, he's a very, he's a very busy man. And I, a know, very busy schedule, I know that. It's so, it's a, we're so blessed like the times that I have been able to interview and they've always been so much fun. So I, I haven't even gotten to the written ones, but I have to do this. I don't have to, but I want to, because I promised her. So sure. she texted me. So no uh, this is from Antonia and she says, I have a question. I work as a psychologist at a nursing home rehab center. And despite the fact that health and nutrition are one of my greatest passions, I've even completed Dr. Campbell's online nutrition course. I am not allowed to give my patients nutritional advice as it falls outside of my scope of practice. Any tips on how to help my often, sadly, very sick patients? Oh gosh. Yeah, that's hard. I mean, I would, I would want to know, it's, it's hard to tell within the scope of this question, like what constitutes nutritional advice? Um, like, is it really outside of the bounds of your job to recommend just eating food that your grandmother would eat? You know, you can sort of, we can think about how to generalize this in a way that it's not going to run afoul of your overlords, but that is still giving really good fundamental advice. So, you know, is it, is it a food that like how many, there are a couple of different metrics that you can apply to it. Is it something that your grandmother or your great grandmother would have had access to? to and you know how many people have interacted with this product to get it in front of you is it is it something that you know was was picked out of a field and shipped on a truck and arrived at a grocery store or is it something that was ground into a powder and extracted and put in a plastic bag and you know so there, there are these different metrics that you can apply and that might be okay to communicate just a, a sort of general eat, you know, the Michael Pollan, eat whole food, mostly plants kind of notion. Um, so that if you can do that, that's going to be helpful. The other thing to keep in mind here is that your the, the evolutionary principles that are bothering you are the um, humans have uh, a, a teaching gene. There's this strong incentive in the Stone Age. If you've got information that other people don't have, there's a lot of unclaimed status associated with that information if you can bring it to people who don't know. So this is why everybody who goes plant-based and has some success suddenly becomes this zealot for the cause and wants everybody to watch Forks Over Knives and everybody to, to convert immediately. Like, you don't understand. This is fundamentally life-changing information and so you need to do it. So this is your teaching gene that is bothering your nervous system saying you're you're leaving a bunch of extra status on the table in this village by not sharing what you know because in the stone age if you knew something that other people didn't know like how to make a more efficient fishing net that could feed more of the village or how to uh, protect yourself against the roving barbarians that kept trying to trying to torch your village to the ground. These were extremely relevant things for survival and reproduction. And if you could share that information that you had either come up with on your own or gained from your travels and and, uh, come into another village that was doing something better, something more efficiently than you were doing it, huge amounts of status. It meant that you were gonna get better mates, better friends. You were gonna be more protected and more loved in the village. And that means this is all relevant because if you're more, more valued in the village, your survival likelihood increases and your reproduction likelihood increases because you're you're more desirable as a friend and a partner to people so we were driven by this teaching gene which it sounds like she has she wants to share this information with people who could really benefit from it and so a lot of this is just realizing that you're not able to do it in this context and that you're you're subject to these uh, this evolutionary drive which is causing you a lot of distress but it's actual you know, in practice ability to change the outcomes for these humans is probably not as high as you think it is um, because people, uh, the, the number of people who are able to actually take action on this information and change their lives is very, very small. Um, again, it goes back to that. You got to have a lot of conscientiousness. You got to have a lot of motivation to get yourself out of the pleasure trap. So if you can share a very generalized version of it with no, no pressure and no insistence, and then try to monitor those irrational thoughts about how you're how you're um, making a mistake by not sharing and teaching more then that's going to probably subdue that for you to some some degree 
Very nice. So apparently if I don't read the nice comments, I start getting texts. So I'll have to read you this one from Thomas. I think she's wonderful and she really makes what she's saying easy to understand. Oh, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. So good. That's, that's good to hear. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Lou says, could Jen talk about, she's not Jen, she's Dr. Hawk to you. Not just <laughs> Could so she talk nice. about competitive mothers? My mom has compared me across so many life domains, weight, athletics, career. Are mothers inherently competitive with their female children? Oh, that's interesting. Um, to some degree, they are. Um, so because it's sort of a, there's, there, there's a Stone Age algorithm about uh, competition for the provisioning resources of the, of the male at the center of the family. So, um, so mothers can be competitive with their daughters at that level, because again, everything in the Stone Age is zero sum. If you have more, that means I have less. You can't, not everybody can have more. Um, so there, there are, especially as the female becomes of reproductive age, um, either it's She's, she's competitive for the attention and the resources of the father, or even worse, if the mother of the, of the you know, adolescent daughter is also unbonded up in the Stone Age village, then they're competing for the same males. That's a really bad scenario, and that can, get, that can sort of launch those processes. Um, the other thing that's going on, it sounds it's probably rooted more in just um, the, what we call the why mom cares paradigm. So we have, the, we have a video on this, and we talk about this on the website as well mom cares we are the only species where parents care about who their children are dating you don't have mama aardvarks who are like you know no one's good enough for my son you know that just doesn't happen in the animal kingdom but humans because we're a very low yield species in the stone age the average woman was having about somewhere between 10 and 15 pregnancies not all of those were determined not all of those children survived but your your job was to be pregnant all the time but even in that context that's not a very reproductively high yield species relative to other mammals. And so because we have very few offspring, we are hyper invested in their success. So you, your genes are walking around in your child and you care a lot about whether your genes in that child survive and reproduce effectively or not. The whole reason that you want the best possible mate that you can get and so you can reproduce to have the most reproductively successful offspring. Otherwise, you wouldn't care. Otherwise, it wouldn't matter who you mated with. You care who you mate with, so you produce successful offspring who then continue the lineage of that DNA through successive generations. So we care um, about the activities of our children for that reason as well. We care about whether little Timmy gets, you know, uh, gets a good sort of report card in kindergarten because we're anticipating, well, what do Timmy's prospects in kindergarten mean for high school? What kind of grades is he going to get in high school? What kind of college is he going to get into? What kind of car is he going to drive? Is it going to be fancy enough to get a good mate to have very reproductively successful grandchildren? So you essentially care about your kindergartner because of his sex life in 15 years. <laughs> so this is really what's going on at a deep sort of ancestral level. We are not conscious of this, but that's what's driving those impulses. That in the, to some degree, probably a fair, fair amount of female competition just for the, the resources and the protection of the males in the village. So some combination of that is probably driving that process. Nice. Linda wants to know where the pups are. They are inside. They are uh, likely to, to uh, bark up a storm if they're out here. There's too much excitement going on. There's a cat who, a cat named Peaches who lives right next door who comes over and tries to steal our food all the time and is just torturing my dog, Melly. So Melly just can't stand that Peaches is out there climbing trees and having fun without her. So. Sunny. Sunny watching live says, Doctor, what does a parent do with a child who has a very high IQ and is a 4.0 GPA student, but thinks smoking weed once a week is not bad for them? How can a parent handle such a case? Oh gosh. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is a sort of like, we, we have another, we have little mantras for all these sorts of things. And um, one of them with, with kids is let them run their own show. So smoking weed once a week is not ideal. I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's pretty damaging, um, not ideal. The odds that you are going to stop that behavior with any kind of lecture, any kind of information, it's, it's um, short of making it very clear that it can't happen in your house um, and that you're very displeased about it and providing your child with as much good evidence-based information as you can. It, it sounds like your kid is old enough to be finding a way to do this um, no matter what. So. 
you you want to run that cost benefit analysis from the place of you know you don't want to be damaging your relationship with your child by sort of poisoning the dynamic between the two of you um, any more than you have to. It sounds like this is pretty low on the bar of um, things that this kid could be doing to destroy their life um, and to to really harm the relationship with you. Uh, and there's almost certainly not that much you can really do about it. We don't know how old exactly we're looking at this kid, but um, by the time he's, he or she is 18 and they're out of the house, then you've completely lost control of the situation. So I would make your feelings very clear, make it also very clear that it's absolutely not allowable in the house. And if it, if it happens in the house, then there will be major, major consequences. But short of that, with this particular concern, I think that's the limitations of, of what you're up to. Um, I have a, a podcast on the Living Wisdom Library site um, with uh, Peter Risenen about parenting specifically where I get into all of this stuff. So that's a more wound out answer. I'm trying to like rapid fire. So if you really want to get into it, that's I get into the, the weeds, no pun intended, um, on that podcast. Okay. Well, it looks like we probably have time for only one more question. And this person is asking for a snarky answer. So I don't know if you're able to do that because you're so sweet. But <laughs> Layla says, are you familiar with the column on Mad, in Mad Magazine called Snappy Answers to Stupid Questions? If so, can you please give me a snarky answer for people who say things like this? When I mention that I don't drink alcohol or eat certain foods, I really try to use the seam strategy and say things like, well, this seems to be working for me. My doctor thinks I'm doing well, et cetera. But there are certain people who just won't back down. And I really would like a snappy answer. For example, my brother-in-law is always trying to push me to drink alcohol, but I've never drank alcohol. He'll say things like, well, it's natural. Our ancestors ate fermented grapes. I say that our species didn't evolve drinking alcohol. So he'll say things like, well, we didn't evolve wearing clothes or wearing shoes or driving, but you do all that. Can you help me think of a clever answer? <laughs> um, alcohol is funny because it actually is a pretty key piece of our success as, as a species um, evolutionarily. There's really interesting work about how the, the reduction in inhibition has allowed more collaboration um, than perhaps we would have been inclined to engage in otherwise. So part of why the Neanderthals died out is because they were very disagreeable and they couldn't collaborate and cooperate very effectively. And so they were sort of siloed into their own little communities and they couldn't share information and improve everybody's station in life where uh, we, we figured that out. Um, and alcohol was part of that story. So, so the argument that it's not part of our ancestral history is a little, it's not the firmest ground to put it on. What I, what I would do if I'm feeling disagreeable and somebody comes after me with that is like, well, you know, sorry, I'm just not into the brain damage. You know, like I like I'm not I kind of I kind of like my brain and I um, I'm not in the in the business of trying to drown it in uh, fermented grain. So that's the that's the most disagreeable, snappiest I can come up with at this at this moment. Um, but yeah, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I'm 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 not a doormat on the agreeable spectrum, but I am an area rug. I'm pretty agreeable. But uh, uh, Dr. Lyles definitely catch him next time he's on because he he can be a little snappier. Oh, wow. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm no carpeting at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you're like, you're way up there for disagreeable. I think, right? Like you're, you're like basically gold hammer level disagreeable. Yeah. So, yeah you, uh, guys, you guys are like the, no, I don't want to, I don't want to ingest yeah. your neurotoxin. Like, no, just like gold hammers. Like I don't want to eat pus and die. Right. So those are, those are the kind of things that you could, but the, but the, overarching principle with something like that is if somebody's being shitty and somebody's being really pushy and causing like relentlessly being being this way in your life just you slowly just fade to black on them you know just ghost them this is why ghosting exists it's just you just you don't need to have crappy people in your life it's it's the it's the principle of the ugly chair if you've got an ugly chair in your living room you can't replace it with a better chair until you get the ugly chair out so if you've got ugly nasty people in your life they're taking up space in your friendship coalition. We only have so much time and resources to devote to the relationships that are most important to us. So don't go wasting your time and energy on people who are giving you bad feedback and being lousy and causing you distress and criticizing you. Just let them, let them go. You don't have to make a big fuss about it and a big argument, but just stop taking their calls and stop investing in the insurance policy that that friendship represents because it's not worth it. That's great. People are wondering if you guys are going to get side-by-side -side treadmills. Oh, yeah. If we had enough space, we definitely would. We're very space constrained at this current spot. So, um, but yes, ideally I've, I've, be, I've learned to deeply covet the treadmill arrangement. It's really cool and uh, a great way to get exercise into your day. So at some point we'll, we'll look into that. 
maybe not side by side because he listens to a lot of a lot of loud music and I'm a little softer kind of like classical hippie music kind of lady so um well, we'd have to reconcile that situation and any more dirt you can ditch on him <laughs> <laughs> there's no dirt he's he's a he's the most wonderful human I've ever met in my life he's fabulous so all the rumors are true Oh, wow, that's beautiful. So people are asking how they can book a session with you. And I, I've been posting the link to the Wisdom Library, but if you just go to the general website, esteemdynamics.com, you can easily do that there with both yeah, Dr. The, Hawk and Dr. Lyle. The, um, uh, at the Esteem Dynamics site, there's the Living Wisdom Library, which is sort of the portal into all of the material that we've pre-recorded and have available to people. But you can also just navigate up to the top menu where there's a consultations tab. So you can click that and it'll take you to my calendar, um, which it only, the calendar system only books 30 days at a time for both me and Dr. Lyle. So it can be a little, um, we, if we're booked out a few weeks, it looks like we're just never available. It's like, oh, you don't have any appointments for the rest of the year. Um, and that's not necessarily true. It just means you have to check back in 24 hours because it'll open up the next day in a sequential sort of way um, and if it's looking really rough and you really want to get in um, you can just send me an email and I will I will try to squeeze you into my schedule I'm still in the middle of moving and um, wandering the earth with um, my bags and my suitcase and my dogs and so I'm a little itinerant at the moment so my schedule is a little bit compressed but I can always I can always figure it out well, that's great. And um, really, guys, if you're going to join for $3, why not just join right now so you can be on the live Q&A today at 2.30? And who knows, maybe Dr. Greg will make another <laughs> appearance. You never know. Seems you are welcome here. You're, you're, there's, a, there's a few people that I will would, would interview every day if they're available. So you're available. I mean, if you're available, you can come on every week, every month, uh, whatever you like. You just let me know your schedule. Uh, and, and thank you so much, people. We're loving this and they just appreciate your wisdom so much. And uh, we're so uh, glad to know you and that you're on the plant-based team. I mean, this is great. I mean, uh, you just kind of had this meteoric rise out of nowhere. We've <laughs> never heard of you. And now <laughs> Michael Greger, I mean, that's like a, I mean, that's like a over like, like that's like an, an actress winning an Oscar. Basically you have won the plant-based Oscar. Well, I feel incredibly lucky. He is, he is truly a, an extraordinary human and um, yeah, it's pretty, yeah. it's pretty amazing. This is, these are the contingencies of life that you just can't see coming. So I, I'm a, I, I'm a lucky lady. Three, I interviewed three people for that job and picked you and I just, I'm <laughs> still waiting for my check, but, but you picked, you picked me, even though it's a Leo Scorpio match, which is pretty like normally as a former astrologer, I'd be like, no way. Yeah, but I read, I read about it first. I mean, I, yeah. I, I read about it. I mean, I used, I used some, some yes, yeah, anyway. yeah. <laughs> yeah. so I should reach out to you for an astrological consultation. It sounds Absolutely. like. Absolutely. That yeah. would be great. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Jen. I can oh, call always a joy. And, yes. uh, oh, anybody and can call me Jen. Yeah. Okay. No. And I'll see you at two 30. I'm looking forward to the live Q and a, and everyone, yes. thank you so much for being here tomorrow at 11 AM. We have Elise Clapper. She is the oh. wife of Dr. Clapper. She's going to be demonstrating chair yoga that everyone can do, giving her favorite recipe for a raw energy soup. So I hope you'll come back at 11 o'clock tomorrow. Thanks again, Jen. Take care. Oh, total joy.